We are back again with On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365. I'm your host, Newsom, and we're here after the one-week break for UFC Vegas 23. We should have had Darren Till versus Marvin Vittori as our main event, but unfortunately, Till broke his collarbone, so he's had to pull out of the fight. I'm actually really disappointed about that, to be honest, because I think that was an amazing fight, a solid main event, and it would have been much closer than some people were predicting. In place of Till, though, at this point, I think it will come as a surprise to absolutely absolutely nobody that Kevin Holland has stepped in on short notice for his second main event in the space of a couple of weeks. I've got to be honest, I'm quite surprised that the UFC have rewarded Holland with another main event against one of the rising fighters in the division after the performance he put in against Brunson. But it is what it is. Also, a reminder that this card will start much earlier than usual. The prelims kick off at 12pm Eastern Time, which is 5pm UK Time. But just before we get into the breakdowns, as always, there's a few things to mention in regards to MMA Play 365. The last event was a really good event across the board. The two official bets were Francis Ngannou and Omar Morales, who both got the job done relatively easily. We also had recommended bets on Ngannou to win inside the distance and Vicente Luque to win too. Our fun gamblers were having fun too, as one of the pre-made parlays won along with five out of the nine parlay piece options. And just very quickly too, at MMA Play 365, we have decided to put a price back on our Dog of the Week product, but it comes with a twist. It's going to be $1.99 per event, which is still cheaper than a coffee and cheaper than its old price. However, the twist is that if the underdog loses their fight, you will receive a 100% refund with our money back guarantee. Remember, we have multiple packages on the MMA Play 365 website for all the UFC betting advice you'll ever need. We also have various subscription lengths and options too, so to see our full service list, please go and visit MMAplay365.com for more information or to sign up today. And let's go, let's break down some fights in the main event. We've got Marvin Vittori versus Kevin Holland. Vittori is currently the minus 310 favourite, the comeback on Holland at plus 255 is the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line... I do think the betting line's quite fair, if I'm being honest. I expected this sort of betting line. I think if you are pushing me for a value side, I would still edge towards Marvin Vittori, though, because I just think he's the more likely fighter to win the fight. And as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week... I do actually see some fluctuation on either side here for different reasons because I think if Marvin Vittori gets to minus 350, minus 360, minus 370, I just think those betting lines are way too wide. And at that point, even though Kevin Holland's last performance was, well, we'll talk about that very soon, even though it wasn't great, I think people will still put money on Kevin Holland if this does get too disrespectful on the betting line. And I think at minus 350, it would warrant Kevin Holland being bet by some people. On the flip side though, I think if Marvin Vittori gets below minus 300, goes to minus 290, minus 280, then I think he'll be in a lot of parlays. I think people will end up betting him and I think that will be pushed to where the betting line is right about now. So ultimately, I see some fluctuation, but I don't think the lines are going to move too far. I think where they're sat right now is roughly where they're going to be when they step inside the cage on Saturday night. So as for how this fight plays out, I think I've got to address the elephant in the room at this point straight away with Kevin Holland's last performance against Brunson it was absolutely shocking you know poor fight IQ he was in there to play around to mess about he wasn't in there to win a fight and it was really disappointing and that's what I meant at the start in the introduction of this episode of the podcast in regards to why I think I was surprised that the UFC have rewarded Holland with another main event just because it was just such a strange, such a poor and shocking performance in that first fight. And I even think deep down Holland would say the same as well. This fight, he's in another main event. He gets a chance to redeem himself now. Just moving away from the style versus style matchup for just a second. I'm actually going to say that Kevin Holland doesn't put that type of performance on again. I don't think he's going to go in there and have a laugh and have a joke about like he did against Derek Brunson. I do think think that some lessons were learned in that fight I think he will take it a little bit more seriously I do expect him to still be smiling to still be talking just because that is Kevin Holland's persona but he's not going to take it to that extreme level that he did against Derek Brunson in my opinion I don't think we see that again however moving back into the style versus style matchup I think this is a bad fight for Kevin Holland Marvin Vittori is on an absolute tear right now he's looking great his striking's looking crisp 
he's got volume, he's got good fundamentals, he'll mix in those fundamentals with the big power shots, he'll rip to the body, to the head, he's just a really good, aggressive, forward moving striker on the feet and he's difficult to deal with, he looks like he's got a chip on his shoulder, he's angry, but he's one of these fighters that fights well with that anger, fights well with that emotion, it doesn't work for every fighter, it does for Vittori, and then when you look at his wrestling, he's got good wrestling, he's strong inside the clinch, he can score single leg takedowns, double leg takedowns, he's got that good traditional wrestling style takedown attempts and then he can also look for trips and throws as well he can get fights down to the mat and when he's on the mat his jiu-jitsu is really good that's where his base is again he's one of those fighters where his base was jiu-jitsu and he's developed his striking to the point where he just fell in love with his striking because he's gotten so good at it so when Vittori's on top he can lay heavy he doesn't rush position to position he's not submission over position he lays heavy he lands ground and pound and he will transition and advance his positions when it's safe to do so and his transitions are fluid as well he's very good on top he's got good top control he will be looking for submissions whilst he's punching you in the face as well those fighters are always really difficult and I think this is what's going to be a problem for Kevin Holland over five rounds three rounds I think it would favor Kevin Holland a little bit more I'm not saying Holland would win a three round fight but I think against Vittori Holland's got more chance of winning the fight over three rounds than five rounds but I think Holland is absolutely matched on the feet Vittori might even be the better striker I don't know if Vittori's going to be able to push him back as easy as he can push other fighters back but if Holland does meet him in the middle I think Vittori's just going to level change and take him down and cause more problems on top than what Brunson caused Kevin Holland. I think if Vittori gets on top of Holland, he's got a really good chance of finishing him if he's got time to work, whether that be through ground and pound or through a submission. Whereas when Brunson took Holland down, yes, he was landing ground and pound, but I just didn't see that real desire to finish. I think Holland does have paths to victory in this fight. I don't think it's a great path to victory. I think Holland does have to stay on the outside a little bit. He's got to be smart. He's got to be tactical. He's got to use fundamentals on the outside, pop a jab out, straight one-twos down the middle, low kicks, really try and pick Vittori apart. But at this point, honestly, I really don't trust Holland to be able to do that tactically over five rounds. I do like this fight for Vittori. I think he's going to have the edge in striking. I think when the judges are looking at this fight, it's going to look like Vittori's the fighter that's aggressive, the fighter that's trying to finish the fight, which the judges are putting so much emphasis on right now. I think Vittori can get Holland down to the mat. I think he can work his jiu-jitsu I just think that Vittori is better in every area in this fight I think it's going to take a super solid tactical five round fight from Kevin Holland or a flash KO for him to win this fight and unfortunately I don't think either of those outcomes are very probable so for those reasons I'm picking Marvin Vittori to win this fight and in the next fight we've got a seriously good fight and even though it's the co-main event I still feel that it's flying under the radar from a UFC marketing perspective we've got Sadiq Yusuf versus Arnold Allen. Yusuf is currently the minus 140 favourite, the comeback on Allen at plus 120 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think this is a very good fight and it's got the potential to be a close fight as well, but I do think that Sadiq Yusuf is the value side at minus 140. I will talk about it a little bit more in the breakdown, but I just feel that Sadiq Yusuf has been in there with the better guys and has beaten the better fighters as well, the better level of competition. So I do feel that he's the value side. As for where the betting lines move throughout fight week, I definitely think there's going to be some fluctuation here. I do think that we will see money coming in on both sides. At the minute, it looks to be the money on Sadiq Yusuf, but if that gets to minus 150, minus 155, maybe even minus 160, then I do think there's going to be a ton of money coming in on Arnold Allen, just people knowing that Allen is value for that money. You know, that would push Allen up to plus 135, plus 140. I think money would come in on Allen there. I think there's going to be fluctuation when one side of this betting line gets too wide, money will come back in on the other side. So when they step into the cage on Saturday night, I think they're going to be roughly sitting where they're at right about now. And as for how this fight plays out, like I said, it's a really good fight. I feel like it's one flying under the radar. You've got Arnold Allen, who's 16-1, and one, unbeaten in the UFC, won seven straight in the UFC. Then you've got Sadiq Youssef, 11-1, and one, unbeaten in the UFC, has won five straight in the UFC. But the one thing that I am going to talk about 
about first, and I did touch upon this in the introduction to this breakdown, is that I do feel that when you look at both records, the level of competition that they've both been fighting inside the UFC, I definitely think there's a difference there. And I'm not trying to discredit anything that Arnold Allen's done because he's looked really good in the UFC, but his last fight was Nick Lentz, who is an aging fighter, declined fighter, definitely isn't anywhere close to where he was in his prime. The win before that was Gilbert Melendez. The same thing there, Gilbert Melendez is one of the best fighters we've ever seen in mixed martial arts but at the time Arnold Allen fought him he wasn't anywhere close to his prime he was declined and therefore it does leave some question marks and then the fight before that Jordan Rinaldi you know I could go on but then you look over to Sadiq Youssef's side Sadiq Youssef has beaten Andre Feely, Gabriel Benitez, Shaman Marias, Mike Davis these are solid wins in the division. These are hard fighters to fight. Fighters that have given Sadiq Yusuf problems. Sadiq Yusuf has had to overcome adversity there. But that list of fighters is significantly stronger than the list of wins that Arnold Allen has. So I feel that when you're looking at the two fighters, that's probably the reason that Sadiq Yusuf is the favourite in this fight. Just because he's been in there with the better quality fighters in the UFC. And I do think that matters. Now in regards to how both of these fighters match up against each other you've got Arnold Hallen who is super technical on the feet you've got Sadiq Yusuf that's very explosive on the feet I think this is a fight that is going to be won and lost in the striking department there could be some moments of wrestling Sadiq Yusuf I know is putting a lot of time into his wrestling his top side BJJ looked great against Andre Feely so we know he's got a good level of control on top once he can establish that top position so maybe we see some wrestling from Sadiq Yusuf I'd be surprised to see Alan try and shoot any if I'm being honest, but regardless of what happens in the wrestling and the grappling departments, I do think this is a fight that's going to be determined by what happens on the feet. I think Arnold Allen is going to be in there sliding in and out of range nicely, looking to really utilise his technical side of his boxing. He's got really good fundamentals. He's got a nice jab. He'll double up on the jab as well. Bites out of a southpaw stance, so he's got a good straight left also. Allen does have a really patient approach to his fights, which works well for him. But one negative aspect to that is I do feel it's a detriment to his game as well because... You look at his numbers, strikes landed per minute is 3.19, which isn't ridiculously low, but I feel with Allen's qualities and abilities, he would be able to output more volume if he pushed forward more aggressively in fights and just decided to pick up that pace. I don't think he's got any sort of cardio issues either, so I think he would be able to output that sort of volume, but he doesn't. He's quite patient, and this is where Sadiq Yusuf is different, because Yusuf isn't a patient fighter. Yusuf is a fighter on the front foot, aggressive, will come forward, will crowd his opponent with big punches, big combinations. He'll rip to the head, he'll rip to the body. He has got good fundamentals as well. He does have a nice jab, but he just really likes to be that bull inside the cage and just let rip with his power. Now, when you look at the style versus style matchup, I can't help thinking that stylistically, it does favour Yusuf more than it does Arnold Allen. You look at Arnold Allen, he's never really fought that extreme explosive striker with big power that's going to rip combinations and really output a high level of volume and you look at the volume of Sadiq Yusuf I said that Arnold Allen outputs 3.19 strikes landed per minute Sadiq Yusuf is at 6.10 strikes landed per minute which is just insane really high volume and then when you look at Sadiq Yusuf's side, he's fought technical strikers, he's fought Andre Feely, he's fought Gabriel Benitez, he's fought Shaman Marias. So I just don't see Arnold Allen posing problems that Sadiq Yusuf hasn't seen before. Now I'm not saying that Arnold Allen can't win this fight because he absolutely can. You look at the Shaman Marias Sadiq Yusuf fight, it was very close and Actually, if Sadiq hadn't dropped Marias in that fight, then he might not have even won the fight. So Allen has got the ability and the potential to really stifle that forward pressure and that volume from Sadiq Yusuf. And if he does that, then he'll take away a lot of the tools and the weapons that Yusuf has and needs to win the fight. And at that point, it becomes a very close fight and gives Allen every chance of winning the fight. But I think the forward pressure of Sadiq, I think the volume, the explosivity, the power that he packs as well, I think think he's going to give him every chance to win this fight here I think that from a judge's perspective if this does go three rounds judges are going to be seeing Sadiq Yusuf as the aggressor as the fighter looking to finish the fight which I keep saying time and time again the judges are putting so much emphasis on that so I think in the eyes of the judges Sadiq Yusuf will look like the fighter that is trying to win the fight trying to finish the fight that will favor him 
And I feel that if there is a finish in this fight, it is going to come from Sadiq Yusuf because of the power that he possesses. He definitely has finishing ability. He can definitely knock anybody out in that division. So for the fact that I think Sadiq Yusuf has the better chance of winning this fight, should it go the scorecards, and the fact that Sadiq Yusuf has got more upside in regards to a finishing ability i'm going to be picking sadiq yusuf to win this fight and in the next fight we've got a good one stylistically we've got kyle dorcas versus the newcomer the dagestani ali ashab kizriev kizriev is currently the minus 120 favorite the comeback on dorcas at plus 100 as the slight underdog as for where the value is on the betting line i do think that the value sits with the newcomer the dagestani kizriev i like his style i think it's going to be dominant in the ufc so i'm looking forward to see what he brings so at minus 120 i do feel that he is that value side as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week it's really interesting because kizriev at bet online opened at minus 235 with dorcas at plus 200 so all that money is coming on kyle dorcas and to be honest with you i do definitely understand that money coming in on dorcas because that opening betting line was ridiculously wide it was way off so yeah i agree with the money coming in on dorcas but as for where it moves through fight week i think we're going to see a little bit of fluctuation but ultimately i don't think the betting lines are going to move too far from where they're sitting right about now as for how the fight plays out though stylistically it's actually a really good fight because you've got both fighters who like to get their fights onto the map but for very different reasons kizriev is what you can expect out of a dagestani born russian he loves wrestling he loves shooting in takedowns getting on top being heavy landing solid ground and pound and then dorcas on the other hand he's a brazilian jiu-jitsu expert he loves to get fights down to the mat to try and establish a good top position if he can but ultimately just to get his opponent down to the mat and to try and submit them and get them out of there so stylistically it's interesting because you're going to see kizriev try and get takedowns try and secure top position himself to control the fight there and land that brutal ground and pound and you're going to see Dorcas trying to sweep trying to reverse throwing up submissions off his back so that I feel is where the fight's going to be won and lost here we're either going to see Kizriev dominate with the wrestling dominate with the top control and really just be a nightmare for Dorcas in those top positions or you're going to see Dorcas throw up a submission get Kizriev out of there or we're going to see Dorcas sweep reverse get on top and I think at that point if Dorcas can get on top of Kizriev then that's going to be his best chance to win because because I feel that Dorcas' top control is going to be significantly better than Kizriev's ability to fight off his back. I just don't see it happening like that, though. I feel that the dominant wrestler in this fight is going to be what I've just said, dominant. I think the striking is going to be very close. There's also a big difference in height and reach. Kizriev is much smaller than Dorcas. Dorcas is going to have a significant height and reach advantage. So in the striking, Kizriev has got to close the distance and get into that boxing range. If he stays on the outside, Dorcas is going to pick him apart. And Dorcas' striking has developed quite nicely as well. But Kizriev just isn't the type of fighter to sit on the outside and accept that. He's a bull rushing type of fighter. He'll like to come forward, get inside boxing range. He'll rip hard punches again to the body and the head. And then he'll start looking for his takedowns. I think that's going to be key in this fight. It's all about that pressure and aggression. It's absolutely key that Kizriev comes in with that pressure and aggression but that's his game that's what he does that's what i've seen on tape he loves to come forward so i don't doubt that kizriev is going to do exactly what he needs to do to put himself in the best position to win this fight ultimately i think it's going to come down to the takedowns i think kizriev is going to be able to score takedowns i do feel that in some moments especially while they're dry that dorcas is going to have some opportunities to try and throw up a triangle or an armbar or even mid takedown trying to lock up a guillotine i do think that dorcas may have some opportunities whilst they're dry early on but the longer this fight goes on I think the better and more comfortable it will get for Kizriev I think Kizriev will be able to score the takedowns I think the top control will be solid for Kizriev I don't think that Dorcas catches Kizriev with a submission I think Kizriev is better than that I think Dorcas's best chance in this fight is either on the feet or trying to get top position but taking Kizriev down is going to be really difficult for Dorcas and even if he does manage to start securing a takedown I think the scramble of Kizriev he'll be able to get in on a single leg and re-wrestle so I think Dorcas getting on top without a sweep or reversal is going to be really tough and then we go back to the striking if he can keep it on the feet long enough and keep it at distance then again he's going to have 
advantages, but Kizriev style just doesn't allow for that. He's not going to sit on the outside, as I've already mentioned. I like Kizriev in this fight. Forward pressure, on the feet, aggression, pressure, getting inside boxing range, landing hard shots, securing takedowns, establishing good top position, and just having top control time throughout the fight. So for those reasons, I'm picking Ali Ashab Kizriev to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Sam Alvey returning down to middleweight versus Julian Marquez. Marquez is currently the minus 185 favourite. The comeback on Alvey at plus 160 as the underdog. As for where the value is on this betting line, I do think the value side is Julian Marquez at minus 185. You know, Sam Alvey hasn't won in so long. I think Marquez is the younger, fresher, hungrier fighter here. So I do think he's the value side. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, we are going to see some fluctuation. We'll see money coming in on Marquez. And I think if that gets to minus 200, minus 210, minus 220, then naturally we'll see people betting on Sam Alvey because Marquez can be a little bit wild, unpredictable. And in some cases, he can underperform at times. So I think if the line gets too wide, we'll see money coming back in on Sam Alvey. But I think we're going to see Marquez enter the fight at minus 200, if I'm being honest with Sam Alvey, roughly around plus 175. As for how this fight plays out, though, it is concerning on Sam Alvey's side. He hasn't won a fight in his last five fights. He's 35 years old, coming back down in weight for the first time in quite a while as well. So when you normally put those things together, it is very concerning. Concerning is the right word here. I think when he's fighting someone like Julian Marquez as well, I think Marquez has had a bit of a tough time of it lately as well. He hasn't really had any fights where he's completely dominated and looked fantastic. He's been in dog fights, gritty fights, fights where he's winning and then suddenly is losing and then he's winning again and nobody knows what the judges are scoring and how the fight's going to continue to play out but in this fight against Sam Alvey I do think that Marquez has got a really good fight for himself stylistically Sam Alvey isn't going to put on a crazy pace against him he's not going to pressure him ridiculously yes Alvey does pack a little bit of power so Marquez has got to be careful of that but Alvey isn't a wrestling threat either that's another thing Marquez has faced a lot of in the UFC just fighters that want to try and take him down and although Marquez doesn't have the worst gas tank I do think that when fighters are trying to take him down they are depleting that tank and they're giving themselves a better chance of beating him but as I've said Marquez isn't going to have any of that in this fight he's going to have a fight where he should be able to dictate the pace Sam Alvey notoriously gets his back pushed against the cage and fights a lot of the fight with his back against the cage and struggling to angle and exit out of there back into the center of the cage so I think Marquez is going to be able to take his time he's going to be able to pick away at Alvey he's just got to be careful of the power coming back from Alvey he's got to respect that Alvey can hurt him in this fight and if he does that and he doesn't rush in or be reckless or start winging crazy wild strikes giving Alvey a chance to counter strike because that's Alvey's game through and through I think that Marquez is going to have a lot of success I think he's going to rack up the volume I think he's going to be landing hard shots on Alvey himself I think he is going to pin Alvey against the cage for the majority of the fight so if there isn't a finish and it does go to the judges scorecards I think Marquez is going to be the likely fighter to win there and like I say I think Marquez is going to be able to put some big strikes on Alvey if he's patient and he picks his spots at the right time so for those reasons I like Julian Marquez in this fight I'm picking Julian Marquez to win this fight and in the next fight we've got the return of Nina Ansaroff versus Mackenzie Dern Ansaroff is currently the minus 120 favorite the comeback on Dern at plus 100 as the underdog as for where the value is on this betting line I think it's one of those fights where the lines are really close that if you've got a solid read on either side then either side is absolutely playable I normally say that for minus 110 pickums, but I do think this fight is really close so if you do have a good read either side like I've said, is absolutely bettable. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, this betting line has been crazy to watch. We've seen Answer off at plus money. We've seen Dern, obviously, now at plus money. We've seen the line flip on multiple occasions. So I fully expect to see that continue throughout fight week. But I know you guys are more interested in where the betting line closes. I think that when they step in the cage on Saturday night, it's going to be Nina Answer off around minus 120, minus 125, if I'm being honest. As for how the fight plays out, though, I've seen a lot of strong opinions online, primarily towards Nina Answer off. So. 
I was really interested to see what I thought when I looked into tape and honestly I think this fight is really really close from Nina Ansaroff's perspective coming back from maternity leave after having a baby that's a big concern and there's no beating around the bushes with that either you know it is genuinely a concern having a baby does crazy things to a woman's body and coming back into a fight camp and competing at the highest level after having a baby, who knows if that fight is going to look the same, you know. And ironically, Mackenzie Dern, the opponent of Nina Ansaroff, when she had her baby, she came back and she lost that first fight back. Albeit, I think she came back a little too soon, but she still looked in good shape, to be fair, better shape than what she did before she had the baby. So I think that it's definitely something that you need to take into consideration. But style versus style and how they match up, Nina Ansaroff is the better striker. But this is where I think it's going to be close because Mackenzie Dern's striking is improving. We saw that against Werner Janjehova in the last fight, a fight that we all expected to be a Brazilian jiu-jitsu spectacle, but it wasn't. It was a 15-minute kickboxing fight and Mackenzie Dern's striking looked decent in that fight. She's aggressive, she comes forward. You can see developments from fight to fight that she is definitely improving in a boxing for sure. I still don't think she's the better striker in this fight, though I think technically Ansaroff is better. But Ansaroff tends to put a lot of her striking combinations and her fights where she looks really good striking whilst she's on the back foot. So you've got Claudia Gadelia's pushing her back, making a counter strike, strike moving backwards. You've got Randa Marcos doing exactly the same as well. And I think Dern is going to fall into that category. I think Dern is going to be the one pushing forward because she knows that she can overexert herself. And if the fight hits the mark, that's exactly where she wants it. Because let's not forget that Mackenzie Dern is the most credentialed, decorated Brazilian jiu-jitsu player in women's MMA. So she's going to have absolutely no problem if Nina Ansarov decides to try and take it down. And I don't expect expect answer of too but the point is when you're trying to judge who's going to be the aggressor and moving forwards it's more likely to be Mackenzie Dern for that reason I think Ansaroff is going to have to put on a clinic with a striking moving backwards and ultimately that's going to make this fight close I think if Ansaroff sticks to her fundamentals pops a nice jab out and hits that low kick as well as Mackenzie Dern's coming in just really puts some nice simple strikes together don't overcomplicate things. I do feel that Ansaroff will end up landing more volume, looking better in the judges' eyes, causing frustration on the side of Dern, forcing Dern to start shooting desperate takedowns, which Ansaroff can be taken down, but she's also got decent fundamentals in defending takedowns as well. So I do think it's going to be difficult for Dern to get her down. I think Dern will score a takedown or two in this fight, but it's all about how Ansaroff responds when she's on her way down. I think Ansaroff may be able to pop back up straight away if she's really quick in doing so. If she doesn't and she spends extended periods of time on the mat, I think Dern will finish her or Dern will just be able to see out that round on top. But if not, then I think Ansaroff is going to be the better striker, even if it is on the back foot. I think she's going to land more volume. I think she is going to frustrate Mackenzie Dern. I think she is going to look better in the judges' eyes. So I am going to side with the current slight favourite in this fight. I'm picking Nina Ansarov to win this fight. In the next fight, we've got a heavy banger. We've got Mike Perry versus Daniel D-Rod Rodriguez. Rodriguez is currently the minus 175 favourite. The comeback on Perry at plus 155 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the value sits with the underdog in Mike Perry at plus 155. I think the line's too wide, it should be much closer. I kind of understand why Daniel Rodriguez is favourite, but I do think he's too big of a favourite in this fight. So yeah, for me, the value side's Mike Perry. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, I do naturally think the line is going to close up. I think Mike Perry will come down significantly. I think Rodriguez will become much closer to a slight favourite than where he is right now. I think when they step into the cage on Saturday night, we're going to see Daniel Rodriguez minus 145, minus 150 with the comeback on Perry area around plus 125 as for how the fight plays out though it's an interesting fight because for Rodriguez to win this fight I think that he's got to outland Mike Perry which isn't an easy thing to do his technical ability has got to be much better than Perry's so you look at Perry's fight against Means Means was just a really technical fighter good straight punches good fundamentals and Daniel Rodriguez has got a decent jab he's got a decent technical ability with his boxing but I think that when he's coming forward he stays too long inside the pocket he's going to be exchanging with Mike Perry I think you can't underestimate Mike Perry in regards to his strike and he's still a really good striker even if he hasn't got his head fully screwed on he's still a good fighter overall and that's the other thing in this fight with Mike Perry I think he's got an underrated wrestling game and an underrated 
top side game as well in regards to his jiu-jitsu if he can get daniel rodriguez down which i think he could get him down if he commits to shooting takedowns i think he could spend time on top that will definitely favor him as long as the fight goes on he'll be wearing rodriguez down a little bit looking better in the judges eyes i don't think a finish would come on the mat ultimately i do think this fight is won and lost on the feet though i just think that mike perry's got a better chance of mixing things up than rodriguez i think mike perry can land on rodriguez we saw dwight grant hurt rodriguez in a fight that should have been stopped and then it wasn't and then suddenly moments later rodriguez found himself on the good side of an early stoppage shall we say so he can be got at he can be hurt i think mike perry is the type of fighter that can get at you that can hurt you and i think that perry's just been in there with the better fighters like i said he's the fighter that i think has got more chance to mix things up if the fight's close because they're both good strikers rodriguez has got volume too so is perry they can both be hittable they've both got power so it's going to come down to if one fighter can hurt the other or which fighter can mix things up and just show the judges something different if it is heading towards the scorecards i like mike perry on both of those counts i think that perry can hurt rodriguez i think he's got the bigger power he's got the experience and i think he can mix things up a little bit better so i'm picking mike perry to win this fight and in the next fight we've got one for the bjj lovers we've got jim miller versus joe selecki joe selecki is currently the minus 235 favorite the comeback on jim miller at plus 195 as the underdog as for where the value is on this betting line i think the line's pretty fair if i'm being honest i think if you are pushing me for a value side i would still edge towards joe selecki but it is minimal value at the current betting line as for where the line moves throughout fight week the current trend is the money on joe selecki joe selecki was as low as minus 180 minus 185 i think but a lot of money has come in on him and i do agree with that he's even minus 250 now in some spots but i feel if it does get wider than that i think that money will come back in on miller ultimately when these two step inside the cage i think the betting line's fair right now i think we might see a bit of fluctuation on either side but i think both fighters will step into the cage sitting roughly where they're at right about now on the betting line as for how this fight plays out though I really like Joe Selecki. I've won money on him in both of his UFC fights. I think that he's a solid prospect, a fighter that is getting better every single time that we see him, that's developing every single time we see him. Primarily, he's a grappler. His BJJ is seriously good. Once he gets on top of his opponents, his transitions are seamless. He'll float from position to position. He won't rush anything. He'll have control whilst he's doing it. He'll be landing ground and pound whilst he's doing it, whilst looking for a potential submission opportunity whilst looking to try and take you back he'll do all that on the mat and he'll and he just puts everything together so well even to the point where if his opponents are looking to try and sweep or reverse positions he's able to block those transitions from his opponents and counter with a transition of his own so whilst they're trying to hit a sweep or reversal he'll block that and then advance himself he's just really really good on the mat he's really advanced and he's going to cause a lot of fighters problems in the division for sure and then in regards to his striking, his striking was always okay, but in his last fight against Hubbard, he came out with his boxing looking sharp, crisp, accurate, it had pop behind his strikes as well, so I think Selec is putting everything together, and honestly, this really isn't music to somebody like Jim Miller's ears, who is a legend, he's a veteran, a future Hall of Famer, but unfortunately, Miller is a fighter that is declined, that isn't anywhere close to where he used to be, however... The X factor that Jim Miller's got is that his jiu-jitsu ability hasn't left him. He's still got that. And this is where Joe selecki has got to be really careful. And this is why I'm saying it's marginal value at minus 235 on the betting line because Joe Selecki against Matt Wyman, go back and watch that fight. When Selecki was taking Wyman down, he was jumping into guillotines. He wasn't being as cautious in regards to the takedowns and making sure his head was in the right position. We know that Jim Miller has got a really good guillotine. It's one of his favorite submissions if joe selecki dives into a guillotine from a takedown like he did against matt wyman he does that one time i think he gets submitted i think jim miller will be able to get him out of there because his guillotine and jim miller's brazilian jiu-jitsu is world class itself joe selecki has got to be cautious and careful in this fight however to counter that a little bit in the hubbard fight joe selecki did shoot in for a single leg takedown but he had his head on the inside that's something i noticed straight away so maybe that matt wyman fight his coaches after the fight was look you can't keep doing this you can't put yourself into the guillotines fair enough you got out of it against wyman but you might not be so fortunate against a better grappler 
that better grappler this time being Jim Miller. Obviously, they didn't know he was going to fight Jim Miller at that point, but at least against Hubbard, I saw that Joe Selecki was putting his head onto the inside rather than the outside. That shows me that they have worked on something. And if they have worked on that in this fight, then it's definitely going to help Selecki. I think Selecki can score takedowns against Miller. He's just got to be careful. He doesn't put himself into a guillotine, in my opinion. But if he can get Jim Miller down safely, I think Joe Selecki's top control, even though Miller has got legit BJJ himself, I do think that Selecki will be heavier, will be bigger, will be stronger and Miller will have similar problems on bottom as what he did against Vince Pichel. And then when I'm looking at the striking, I don't think Miller's a bad striker. He's still got pop on his strikes, but I don't think he's going to cause Selecki any real issues. In fact, I think the developments that Selecki's making, again, being the younger, faster, fresher fighter, hungrier fighter, fighter that's on the up opposed to, you know, declining, I think Selecki's striking will be better than Miller. So on the feet, I like Selecki. On the takedowns, I like Selecki slightly. He's got to be careful of leaving his head in, as I've already mentioned a million times. But the top control time, again, I favour Selecki. So for those reasons, I'm picking Joe Selecki to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Scott Holtzman versus Matthias Gamrot. Gamrot is currently the minus 230 favourite, the comeback on Holtzman at plus 190 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I think the value sits with the underdog here at Holtzman at plus 190. I understand why Gamrot's the favourite for sure, but the betting line is just too wide. It shouldn't be this wide, it should be much closer. So for that reason, Holtzman is the value side. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, I do think that we are going to see Holtzman money coming in at some point. The current trend is the Gamrot money, but I think it can only go so far before Holtzman's at plus 200, plus 210 and people are putting money on him because I think the fight could be relatively close. I think people will recognise that. Ultimately, when they step inside the cage, I do think Gamrot is going to drop down to minus 200, maybe even just below minus 200, but I think he's going to be at that sort of range. As for how this fight plays out, though, it's going to be really interesting. I think we're going to see a true mixed martial arts fight here. I think we're going to see some striking from both sides, some aggression from both sides, some hard shots from both sides. I think we're going to see takedowns landed, takedowns defended. I think we're going to see a bit of a mix of everything in this fight. And Holtzman's game Holtzman can strike he's not the fastest striker he's not the cleanest striker but he's effective in what he does the fact that he can come forwards the fact that he can put pressure on his opponents and he does pack power in his strikes as well the thing is with Gamrot on the feet I do think that he doesn't hit as hard as Holtzman but I think his movement and his speed is better and that might just give him the edge on the feet if he can just make sure he's not there to be hit he keeps his head off the center line and he can angle and exit back out into the center of the cage use his distance management start to dictate the pace of the fight I think those sort of things fall into Gamrot's realm and on the feet I expect it to be close. I expect Holtzman to be landing the harder strikes, but I expect Gamrot to be landing the more volume, being the quicker and more effective striker. In regards to the takedowns, I don't think that there's going to be enough top control time in this fight from either side to really affect the fight should it hit the scorecards. And I don't think we see a finish on the mat either. So I don't think the ground game is going to play too much of a factor, but I can still see takedowns from both sides. I think both fighters will attempt them. I think the fight is won and lost on the feet. And if this was a straight up boxing fight inside the cage with MMA, obviously, then I would favour Holtzman because I do think he's going to hit the harder shots on Gamrot. But the thing is, I think Gamrot will mix in his boxing with his kickboxing. I think he'll land low kicks as well. So although Holtzman may look like the fighter looking to take Gamrot's head off more than the other way around, I think Gamrot will land more volume but be more diverse with his striking, which will lean the judges towards Gamrot should it hit the scorecards. In regards to finishing ability, I think both fighters are just as likely as each other to finish each other. So I don't think there's an edge there. I think Gamrot's the more likely fighter to win on the score. Card. So for that reason, I'm picking Matthias Gamrot to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Norma Dumont versus the newcomer, the one that nobody's surprised about that the UFC have signed, Erin Blanchfield. Norma Dumont is currently the minus 240 favourite, the comeback on Blanchfield at plus 200 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the value sits with Blanchfield at plus 200. I think the line should be much closer. I do appreciate that Blanchfield is moving up a weight class on 10 days notice, short notice to take this fight, and it's a UFC debut. But she's got legit skills, which I will talk about very soon. So at plus 200, I do feel that 
she is definitely more bettable than DeMont at minus 240. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week though, I do think that we're going to see this line close up a little bit. I think we will see Blanchfield close down to around plus 150, plus 155. I'm not sure it'll go any lower than that because of the short notice and the fact that she's moving up a weight class, all that stuff that I've already spoken about. But I do think the line is going to close significantly by the time both fighters step into the cage on Saturday night. As for how this fight plays out though, Blanchfield Blanchfield is a seriously good prospect. She's only 21, but she's got quite a bit of experience already. She has been in the cage with some really good fighters. Her only loss in MMA was a split decision to Tracy Cortez in a fight where I actually think that Blanchfield won. She was only 19 in that fight as well. So that tells you that the hype is real behind Blanchfield. So she's got a really clear path to victory. She's predominantly a grappler. She's a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but don't let that fool you. She took home gold in the Eddie Bravo invitational so she's a world champion in brazilian jiu-jitsu you can see it on the mat as well when she takes her fighters down her wrestling's getting better her striking's getting better like i said she's 21 so the development she's making from fight to fight are astronomical right now and she will be a very difficult fighter to beat and definitely one that we need to keep an eye on moving forwards but the issue that i do have in this fight my main concern is the fact that norma demont is a former 145er. Blanchfield is a 125er. They're both fighting at 135. So you've got Dumont coming down from 145. You've got Blanchfield coming up from 125. Dumont is very physical. She's big. She's heavy. She's strong. And you can see that inside the cage. She's also very aggressive. She's got good boxing. She has power in her punches as well. She throws in combinations, moving forwards and backwards. She's decent. So that's where Blanchfield's holes are. If you want to call them holes in the striking, she has developed a striking so much. If you watch her fights in chronological order, Blanchfield has seriously got better. But I don't think that she's going to have too much success going toe-to-toe with DeMont. She's got to try and take her down. Now, the one thing I mentioned in regards to weight, I do need to counter that with the fact that Blanchfield is going to be heavier herself. She's going to be a little bit thicker, a little bit stronger. And if she was a striker that relied on creativity, elusivity, movement and speed, then I would say that putting that extra weight on is a detriment to her style. But actually, Blanchfield needs to get the fight down to the mat. She needs to wrestle. She needs to be heavy on top. And that additional weight will aid her style in this fight so I do have to counter with that point I am going to lean towards the fighter who has the strongest skill set in my opinion and that's Blanchfield I think Blanchfield's grappling if she can get this fight to the mat it is a very clear path to victory for her there and I think that she gives herself every chance of winning this fight if she can score the takedowns and if she is scoring takedowns it might make Demont a little less aggressive knowing that she can get taken down as well so there are a few catalysts that could effect of this fight ultimately i really like what i see from blanchfield i think her skill set is definitely one that's going to cause a lot of fighters problems in the ufc i think that this is definitely not an easy fight but at plus 200 i think the line's too wide i think that blanchfield's got legit skills and qualities that can help her win this fight she's got a clear path to victory so i'm going to side with the underdog i'm picking erin blanchfield to win this fight and in the next fight we've got john mcdessie versus the newcomer ignacio bahamondas Bahamondes is currently the minus 190 favourite to come back on McDessie at plus 165 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the line is quite fair if I'm being honest. If you are going to push me for a value side, I would maybe lean towards the underdog of McDessie, but honestly, it's going to be a difficult fight. I think it could be a close fight. But I do think the line is relatively fair. As for where the line moves throughout fight week, I think we're going to see some fluctuation. I think we are going to see more money coming in on Bahamondes. But if he gets to minus 220, minus 225, then I think we'll see that dog money coming in on MacDessy. Ultimately, when they step in the cage, I do expect Ignacio Bahamondes to be around the minus 200 mark with Mcdessey at plus 170, maybe plus 175. As for how the fight plays out, though, Bahamondes has got some really good advantages in this fight. He's a tall, long, rangy striker. He's got kickboxing experience and you can really see that he puts combinations together nicely he'll switch stances he'll put volume in there he'll throw straight punches down the middle he'll keep his fundamentals on point he'll mix things up as well in regards to firing at the head the body and he'll use kicks leg kicks body kicks spin kicks he's a really good striker he doesn't look like he packs too much power so that might be 
one of the things that helps Mac Desi close the distance because Mac Desi ultimately is a kickboxer himself. He has kickboxing experience. It's just we forget about that because of how long he's been in the UFC. I think this fight is going to be won and lost on the feet. The thing is with Mac Desi, even though he's at a disadvantage in regards to the height, the reach and the range, I do feel that he has the ability and the Korean zombies quite like this as well. He's got the ability to really slow fights down, really make fights be played out at his own pace. So ultimately dictating the pace of the fight. And that helps John McDessie really grow into the fights and really start to put his shots together to give him the best chance of winning. But I think against Baja Mondes, I don't think he's going to be able to slow the fight down like he's been able to in previous fights. Because I think Baja Mondes will see that there's a big height range advantage for himself. And I think once he starts getting off on these straight shots, I think Mac Desi will start to back up a little bit. But Baja Mondes won't rush in and close the distance and give Mac Desi what he wants, which is that distance being closed. I think Baja Mondes can keep this at range. I think he can land more volume. He's the younger fighter, the fresh pressure fighter the fighter that's probably going to be more hungrier as well so for those reasons i'm picking ignacio bahamandas to win this fight and in the next fight we've got jorgen de castro versus the returning judges danho jorgen de castro is currently the minus 300 favorite the comeback on danho at plus 250 as the underdog as for where the value is on the betting line i think jorgen de castro at minus 300 is absolutely fair if i'm being honest danho hasn't fought for almost five years and in that time castro has been active and winning fights so yeah i I think minus 300 is fair. If you are going to push me for a value side, I would still probably edge towards Jorgen de Castro being the value side at minus 300. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, honestly, I really don't see too many tickets coming in on Danho. I think Jorgen de Castro is going to be the fighter that's going to be bet here, whether that be straight or whether people just start including him in a lot of parlays. I definitely think when people are looking at both of these fighters, it's going to more likely be the money on Castro than Danho. So I think Castro will go up to minus 330, maybe even minus 350 and that's probably where he's going to step inside the cage at on Saturday night as for how the fight plays out though like I said the big thing with Dan Ho here is the fact that he hasn't fought for nearly five years September 2016 was the last time he stepped inside the cage MMA evolves very quickly and I think a lot has changed since 2016 so I think the fact that Castro is firing hard low kicks for example that's not something that Dan Ho would have had to have dealt with to a great extent back in 2016 as those leg kicks probably started originating back then, maybe 2017. So that is only one element to this. But the fact that Dano hasn't fought for five years is definitely concerning. I think that Jorgen Di Castro is a good enough striker to deal with Dano. I think the fight will predominantly take place on the feet. I think it's won and lost on the feet. If there is a takedown, it might be attempted from Dano to try and get Di Castro down, but I don't think he's going to get him down easily. I think Di Castro is going to beat up that lead leg of Dano with solid low kicks. I think Di Castro is going to be patient, but when he does does come forward he's going to burst forward with hard combinations and I just don't think it's a good fight for Dano to come back to I do think that Jorgen de Castro is going to take him out of there so I'm picking Jorgen de Castro to win this fight and in the next fight we've got a solid fight here and I've got no idea why it's buried on the prelims but we've got Hunter Azure versus Jack Shaw Jack Shaw is currently the minus 150 favorite with the comeback on Azure at plus 130 as the underdog as for where the value is on the betting line I do think the value sits with the underdog in Hunter Azure at plus 130 I think the line's too wide I think it should be much closer and I will touch upon that very shortly but as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week Jack Shaw has got a lot of hype behind him he's an undefeated fighter and he's an undefeated grappler as well which I do feel that adds to that hype as well so I think that more money's going to come in on Jack Shaw I think he's going to walk into the cage minus 160 minus 165 and if it does get much wider than that I think we will see Hunter Azure money coming back in so I do think Jack Shaw is going to enter at minus 160 minus 165 with Hunter Azure around the plus 140 plus 145 mark as for how this fight plays out though I think one of the main reasons why the betting line should be much closer is the level of competition that Jack Shaw's fought so sure he's looked great his striking looks technical his grappling looks good his wrestling looks good he's putting everything together really well a true mixed martial artist 
But you look at the level of competition he's fought in the UFC, Aaron Phillips, Noeline Hernandez, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but those two aren't UFC caliber fighters, Hunter Azure is. And then the guys that Jack Shaw's fought outside of the UFC, so Cage Warriors and earlier in his career, he's never fought a single fighter, in my opinion, that is that UFC caliber fighter. So what that means is that Hunter Azure is the best fighter that he's ever fought. It's going to be his biggest test to date as well. And Hunter Azure has got a really difficult style to deal with. So Azure's predominantly a wrestler. That's where his background lies. Now, Jack Shaw's got wrestling as well which is great but Hunter Azure is really short stocky he's thick and he's powerful he's got a ton of strength and I think that's going to be a big advantage for him in this fight because pretty much every Jack Shaw fight ends up with Jack Shaw wanting to take his opponent down get on top establish top position get the back and choke you out but I think that the strength of Hunter Azure is really going to make Jack Shaw work to the point where Shaw might not even be able to take him down if I'm being honest I do think Shaw will get him down down once or twice but Azure doesn't settle on his back he likes to pop right back up to his feet once he pops back up to his feet even if Jack Shaw's in a dominant position on the cage in the clinch Azure's strength is going to make itself apparent at that point I think with the wrestling I think Hunter Azure's the better wrestler and this is the thing in this fight I think Jack Shaw is going to be defensively wrestling more than he's offensively wrestling I think Azure after that win against Cold Miller purely down to the takedowns it is going to be Azure trying to take Shaw down the problem I've got with Azure there though is his top control isn't great you can pop right back up so when you are comparing the top side grappling of Shaw and Azure Shaw is the better top side grappler it's just I genuinely don't know how much success Shaw is going to have in getting Azure down and establishing that top position Hunter Azure is not Aaron Phillips or Noelina Hernandez. He's going to give Shaw a real fight here. So when you look at the striking of these guys, I think Shaw by far is the more technical striker in regards to the boxing. But with Azure, Azure comes forward with aggression. He wings bombs, big hooks to the head, to the body. He's got a tough low kick as well. Now for me, normally this would be really concerning for any fighter that puts all this power into these combinations because Azure strings long combinations together. So putting everything into every shot it would definitely give me concerns about a gas tank and cardio but Hunter Azure has got a big gas tank I've seen him on multiple occasions go into round three still pressuring heavily still wrestling heavily still winging big combinations together after doing that through rounds one and two as well so for me Azure's gas tank is definitely a valuable tool for him because it allows him to be aggressive to put power in everything and when he connects on his opponent's chin more often than not if it's a clean connection they'll drop and then that can either either be an instant round winner for Azure or it could lead to a finish as well I think that Jack Shaw may get a little overwhelmed with how much Azure's coming forward and how aggressive he is and how difficult he is to take down and to deal with inside clinch positions for Jack Shaw in my opinion very early in this fight he has to stifle that forward pressure of Azure and he can do that by popping a jab out as Azure's coming in hitting with low kicks keep at range just make sure you're moving laterally side to side not let in Azure take control of the fight dictate the pace and the range and just make sure that you're popping something out at Azure every time he's coming in but the thing is I don't think that'll deter someone like Azure I think he'll just be able to keep coming forward I think this fight is going to be quite close at points because like I said I do think that Shaw can score a couple of takedowns here and if he does score a takedown and Azure shows his back to get back up to his feet and Shaw jumps on that back gets his hooks in or gets a body triangle in then Shaw is either going to win that round or submit Azure and I think that's the reason why this fight could be quite close if Shaw does the right things from any initial takedowns ultimately though I think Azure's fought the better level of competition I think he's the slightly better wrestler I think in regards to striking I don't think he's the better striker but in the judges eyes he will look like the better striker because he'll be the aggressor he'll be the fighter looking like he's trying to finish the fight and I think Jack Shaw is going to have problems for the first time in his career in this fight so for that reason I'm going to side with the underdog here I'm going to pick Hunter Azure to win this fight and in the next fight we've got the newcomer Luis Saldana versus Jordan Griffin Saldana is currently the minus 140 favorite the comeback on Griffin at plus 120 as the underdog as for where the value is on the betting line the betting line is probably where I'd have expected it to be if I'm being honest but I do think if you are going to push me for a value side I probably would say that Jordan Griffin at plus 120 is the better than Saldana at minus 140. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, 
I do think there's going to be a little bit of fluctuation. I do think the betting line's going to close up a little bit. I don't think it'll be as drastic as going into a minus 110 pick em, but I could see Saldana entering this fight at minus 125 with Jordan Griffin, plus 105, maybe plus 110. As for how this fight plays out though, it's going to be really interesting to see how Saldana deals with the wrestling and the grappling of Griffin because if this fight stays on the feet, I think Saldana pieces Griffin up all day long and that's sort of where I was at when I said that I expected the line to be where it is here. But Griffin is a little bit unpredictable. He has those fight IQ moments where he switches off a little bit and he can make mistakes and that's not going to be good if he's striking with Saldana on the feet. I think here Griffin's got to take Saldana down. The problem is I haven't seen too much of Saldana's defensive wrestling and his defensive grappling. Now there was one fight back in 2017 against Alex Wiggs Jr. which he lost the decision and that was based on him getting taken down and controlled for three rounds but honestly that's nearly four years ago. A lot can change in that time. Developments can occur so he could look completely different in that respect here. It is one of the unknowns in this fight for sure, but if this fight is won and lost on the feet, then it is going to be Saldana that beats Jordan Griffin because he's just a better striker. It is obviously very difficult to make a judgment on this fight based on the fact that we have no idea if those developments in the wrestling and grappling are going to be there from Saldana but the fact that I know that there's a big gap in skill on the feet and Saldana is a clearly better striker than Griffin it's a really big advantage that he's got on the feet I have to side with Saldana so I'm picking Luis Saldana to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Da Unjung versus the man that appears to have had the longest fight camp in MMA history we've got William Knight Da Unjung is currently the minus 140 favourite the comeback on Knight at plus 120 as the underdog as for where the value is on the betting line I think the value sits with the underdog in William Knight I think that at absolute minimum this fight should be a pick'em so the plus money on Knight I think is the value side as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week this line has been crazy as well and one that's kept swinging both ways Da Unjung Jung opened the favourite then not long after that he hit plus money with William Knight being the favourite and then now Darren Jung is being back to the favourite whereas William Knight's now at plus money so I do expect to see some fluctuations throughout fight week but I don't think we see the line flip anymore I think it's flipped too much I think it's settled with Darren Jung the favourite and William Knight the slight underdog I do think it'll close up a little bit come fight night I think we'll see William Knight get into the cage plus 110 maybe plus 105 as for how the fight plays out though honestly I thought Darren Jung was a serious prospect until the Sam Alvey fight that has really put me off him quite a bit I think that again no disrespect to Sam Alvey but when you're an active striker and you're quick on the feet with good movement I think that your performance should be better especially when you're fighting a fighter that doesn't have too much movement that does back up that does fight a lot with his back against the cage and Darren Jung just didn't show me that he started off well he hurt Sam Alvey at that point he should have been pushing forwards and looking to try and finish the fight but he didn't he allowed Sam Alvey to get off on these pop shots it wasn't even combinations that Alvey was putting together it was just one punch at a time and honestly I just don't know what happened to Darren Jung inside the cage and he got that close that the fight was scored a draw so I wasn't really impressed with Darren Jung and maybe a bit of that not being impressed was my own fault because I had Darren Jung as a potential prospect in the division with how good he looked prior to that fight but in this fight he's fighting a better fighter in my opinion in William Knight he is still going to have the same advantages overnight though he's still going to be the faster fighter he's still going to be the fighter that will likely output more volume that's got better movement but William Knight is stern he's tough he'll counter back he's got big power he'll land hard shots he'll mix in low kicks as well and if Darren Jung is coming forwards and trying to strike but getting countered by William Knight with these big powerful shots it might be one of those fights where William Knight just earns too much respect from Darren Jung and to the point where Darren Jung really is being hesitant coming into range that'll allow William Knight to push forward I think William Knight might be able to score takedowns in this fight as well I don't think the takedowns will come easily but if he does get on top of Darren Jung he's so difficult to get off you just because of how strong and how heavy William Knight lays on top so the takedowns won't come easy but if Knight can get on top then he is going to cause real problems for Darren Jung and that's why I like William Knight in this fight because I feel that although he has got some disadvantages in this fight in regards to speed and movement I think the advantages he holds is the power the fact that he's tough he's durable he'll be able to get respect from his opponents and if that respect is shown then there'll be hesitancy there that'll allow William Knight to grow into the fight it'll allow Knight to start picking his shots a little bit more to start adding up the numbers himself 
and he might have this wrestling advantage as well. And if he gets on top, he's going to have a top side advantage. For those reasons, I'm picking William Knight to win this fight. And in the final breakdown of this episode, we've got Impa Kasanganai versus Sasha Palatnikov. Kasanganai is currently the minus 280 favourite. The comeback on Palatnikov at plus 240 as the underdog. As for where the value is on this betting line, I honestly think that the betting line's too wide. I completely understand why Kasanganai is the favourite, rightful favourite for sure, but I just think if you're looking at where your money's going in this fight, I think Palatnikov is a better bet at plus 240 than what Kasanganai is at minus 280. As for where the value moves throughout fight week, I think we're going to see the lines close up a little bit. I don't think it's going to close too much though because if Kasanganai did get down to minus 240, minus 230, then at that point we'd likely see a ton of money coming back in on Kasanganai, pushing him back to where he is now. So ultimately where the betting lines are sitting right about now, I think that's where both fighters are going to enter the cage come Saturday night. As for how this fight plays out though, it is a tough fight for Palatnikov, but I don't think it's a fight where he's going to get absolutely whitewashed. In his debut against against Louis Kose, Palatnikov was plus 275, again a big underdog, he showed heart, he showed durability in that fight, because Kose had him hurt early in the fight, and ultimately Kose blew his low trying to finish him, tired out himself, Kose did get a second wind a little bit later in the fight, but ultimately Palatnikov just wasn't having any of it, he survived those scary early moments, and he came back into that fight, he looked solid from a striking perspective, he scored a takedown against Kosey, he was landing good ground and pound against Kosey as well, the problem is I just don't think Impa Kasanganai will A, blow his load early in the fight if he does hurt Palatnikov early on, and B, I don't think Kasanganai will gas like Luis Kosey gassed either, I think kasanganai has got a good gas tank, and that's ultimately why I think it's a difficult fight for Palatnikov, because let's be honest, if Kosey didn't put everything into trying to finish Palatnikov in that first round, if he didn't gas out badly, then I think that Kosey would have won the fight relatively easily, but the problem is he did, and I don't think Kasanganai does that, I think Palatnikov is going to have moments in this fight, he is a decent striker, he has got good takedowns, he has got decent top control, he's good at scrambling, I think Impa Kasanganai again on the other side, he's a good striker, decent wrestling, good top control, but Kasanganai really packs power in combinations inside boxing range, and I think that's where Palatnikov's going to have problems, I don't think Palatnikov has got the ability to keep Kasanganai at range for long periods of time in this fight, and that's going to be a problem, I think Kasanganai does close the distance often, I think he does pack big powerful combinations inside of boxing range, and because of that I actually think that the path to victory for Palatnikov is to take Kasanganai down, I think he's got to take him down and often just to break up those moments of aggression and the big combinations and when Kasanganai closes the distance, use that distance being close to level change or just get a hold of Kasanganai and look to trip him down to the mat and spend some time in top position and ultimately I think that because of that path to victory that's why I think that Palatnikov is a better bet at the current betting line but I just don't know if that's going to be enough to beat Kasanganai. I think if it is one of those fights where Kasanganai is landing the big powerful shots on the feet but Palatnikov breaking the play up a little bit in regards to scoring some takedowns or just clinching up with Kasanganai I still think that that's going to look better in the judges eyes for Kasanganai and I also think with the powerful punches it gives Kasanganai more upside in regards to her finishing ability so I do think that the betting line should be closer I do think Palatnikov could have a path to victory with the takedowns and the wrestling and the top control but I am going to be picking Impa Kasanganai to win this fight and that's all for this episode of On The Money Line. I hope you all enjoyed it and once again guys I'd appreciate all likes to the video and subscriptions to our MMA Play 365 YouTube channel too. Remember you can get all the betting advice you'll ever need over at MMAPlay365.com. We cater for the long term gamblers that like to build their own bets and strategies. Gamblers that just want to follow exactly what I bet on and as a long term winning gambler over the last four years that will likely come good for you. And we also cater for you fun gamblers that like the long shot fun parlays or hackers accumulate as we call them in the UK. Even if you only want our best value underdog for the event, which comes with a money back guarantee by the way, we have plenty of different packages and subscription options for you guys to choose from and they're all at very affordable prices too. Just hop on to MMAplay365.com to see what's best for you. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you at the next event.